One, two, three. Welcome to Scaled Up. My name is Joe Austin. And for those who have just joined us, can I remind you that Scaled Up is a joint production between Falcha Fiercy here and Phil and Fubble. Our My guest today is someone, I suppose, whose name is well known in every part of Ireland. It's Tim Pat Coogan. And I say that as if it's just uh, rolls off the tongue. To try and, and, and give a concise description of Tim Pat is virtually impossible. He is a, an author. He is a journalist. He is someone who has traveled the world and interviewed the great, the good, and the not so good. He has been producing over books over a, a, a period from the 1960s, and he's written on a very diverse uh, range of subjects. He has produced books in the aftermath of where we are in the aftermath of 1916. He's produced books on Michael Collins, uh, on De Valera, on the GAA, which I want to return to because we're in West Belfast. He's produced books on a variety of things. So, Tim Pat, welcome to Skilta. Thank you. I suppose if we ever begin at the beginning, we should begin uh, with, your, with your own background, where you were born. Tell us a wee bit about your, the early Tim Pat Coogan. Well, I was born uh, in what I suppose in class terms, uh, in those days would have been called uh, an upper middle class family in County Dublin. My uh, maternal grandfather, Paddy Toll, had been um, discriminated against in the north. He was a native of the Maui, and uh, he, he was worn by his superior, who was described in the family with great wonderment as being, quote, a decent Freemason, unquote. They were never aware that such a creature existed before that, but he advised him be the wrong uh, religion, and therefore all the study he was doing was wasted. So he came down south, joined the RIC, rose in the ranks, became a, a DI, retired, and began running a post office in a pound as cops do, and do something when they leave. Um, do a bit of work for a change, I suppose. And uh, in a place called Hazel Hatch, out in the, the Canal Bank in Kildare. So the Anglo-Irish War came on, and uh, one night the um, IRA came calling. What they wanted uh, was the, the money from the post office, which of course was refundable, and Paddy would have given it to them. But my wall-to-wall -wall mouth granny very imposing, six foot tall, red haired lady. Uh, her two two of her sons are away studying for the priesthood um, in Genoa in Italy. And she said to uh, the leader of the ASU, something to the effect, how well you wouldn't dare come uh, if my two fine sons, Tim and Frank, were here, you bastard. And as it happened, the only uh, leader of uh, an ASU in Ireland at the time happened to be our man standing in the Haggard Financier. So he lost the head, set fire to the place, and uh, threw their pup into the, their dog into the fire for good measure. But uh, Patrick, uh, I was told the story, the way Ireland settles down is quite remarkable, um, by the father of a man who sat, uh, who, well, he's a boy, but I knew him, sat beside me in Blackrock College. And uh, he brought me down to tell me his father wanted to talk to me. His father was a tailor, and he cut down the suits that uh, were made for myself and my brother to go to Blackrock uh, after my father died in the year 1948. We were only very, very small at the time, 12, I was. <clears throat> and Patrick went on to uh, become uh, the chief... Um, rate collector for uh, the counties of Dublin and Wicklow. So he took his revenge on Catholic, Protestant and dissenter. And uh, my father came from a well-doing family in Castlecomer, County Kilkenny. And he, he was a bright man and uh, studied. And he uh, went to UCD and an athlete. He won a Seagrasham Cup medal with them. Uh, he thought he was in intelligence. His main thing was setting up the Sinn 
in courts and the underground apparatus of government that they hollowed out the British rule with. And then after that settled down and uh, the Civil War passed over their heads, very destructive, and the growth of the country, uh, when I hear people talking about the COVID now and the damage done and they can't afford to pay the poor people who, who are out of work, and I think of the, how they got the money to build up Ireland after the two wars. I mean, O'Connell Street was devastated twice in 16 and then subsequently during the Civil War, for example. Anyway, um, you've probably heard of General Owen O'Duffy. He was yes. a famous IRA commander along the border. And uh, he, uh, in fact, Michael Collins thought he should have succeeded. He had said before he died that he thought the man who should succeed him was Michael what was O'Duffy. Because O'Duffy had O'Collins' uh, view of the North. Once the treaty was dry and they got the three states settled and they got the British Army out, they'd have another go. And um, this didn't sit well with Willie Col uh, Cosgrave, W.T. Cosgrave, and the rest of Cumberland A, the people who now ran the free state that emerged from the Civil War in the South. And uh, there was setting, and they couldn't. Owen, for obvious reasons, want to be made uh, commander-in-chief of the army, but they weren't going to have that. So they <clears throat> were setting up quite an achievement, actually, an unarmed police force in the middle of the Civil War. And they gave that to Owen instead. But one day they sent for my father, Willie Cosgrave, and uh, said, listen, Ned, as you know, we're setting up this new police force and we're putting... Uh, Owen in charge, we can't let him have the army. He's a wild man. We go in there and watch him. So at 24, my father became uh, the first deputy commissioner of Angarda Shikana. And uh, they ran a pretty efficient police force until De Valera came in then in the early 30s. And they were all purged and promotion for oh. on the Civil War side, the wrong side as they saw it, ceased. And it was a pretty oppressive time. And my father, as I say, was bright and he cycled in from our house, which had the grandiose title of uh, Tudor Hall in Monkstown, South County, Dublin. And uh, he had the price of the fair, really. Uh, pension was, you know, thing of the past. And it, He cycled in an old wood. Uh, he wasn't a man to hold a grudge and uh, sort of jolly fellow. Um, and he used to have a regular lunch with the group of them. One was Sean McBride, the other was Vivian de Valera, son of Eamon de Valera, who had, uh, you know, really actively worked to get him out of the police force. Another man called uh, Vincent. Um, Oh, I've forgotten his name now, but Vincent was, I remember, he was the head of the Knights of Columbanus. He was a lawyer, and he uh, helped to draw up the Constitution for Ghana. And uh, one night, or one day, he uh, rather surprised the Knights uh, and their wives and families by taking off with a lady who was A, not his own wife, and B, she was uh, Jewish. So that was my family background. And then in 48, my father died just a couple of weeks before he became, he would have been the Minister of Justice in the coalition government that uh, put De Valera out of power for the first time after 16 years. And um, we went from, you know, sort of genteel poverty to very ungenteel poverty. In those days, the uh, children's allowance was two and sixpence uh, a week for the third child and each subsequent child. So we only had three. Can I, can I just, can I, can Sorry, I interrupt you just a wee second? Just a minute. I want to just paint that sort of as a, a succinct picture. So you're, you are, you are the grandchild of a former policeman. You are the son of an IRA vet, an IRA activist who became a TD and became deputy, uh, deputy commissioner of the guards. Your mother, have another, another former policeman, yeah. Uh, and in your fact, mother. In fact, he went on, I should add, I think just to add to that mixture, an interesting political mixture, a stew. Uh, my father succeeded Willie Cosgrave as the TD for Kilkenny. And he, he was secretary of the Fine Gael party for a while before he died. 
but carry on. And your your mother, your mother, who was very influential and cold in your life, a journalist with the Herald and a former beauty queen. Yeah, well, <clears throat> she was very much at pains to point out she wasn't one of those uh, uh, people with bathing costumes and all that nonsense. What happened was that uh, setting up the new state, uh, one of the city manager, I think, uh, of um, Dublin, uh, saw that the Paris had elected a civic queen, not alone on her looks, but on her intellectual attainments. And uh, got, there was a cultural side to it. And uh, that's what they, uh, my, my mother was appointed that. And uh, she was, uh, did a bit of acting with the Abbey and she always wrote. She wrote a very famous novel before she died called uh, The Big Wind. It was really the story, it took the story through the eyes of a, an, a landlord and his wife, uh, through the uh, famine and the land league, all the agitation. And uh, my father was also very interested in history. I remember he had um, sections, of bound, small bound volumes in the kitchen in Castle Comer, where you learned about uh, people like Galloping O'Hogan and uh, uh, all sorts of, or Care O'Doherty in, in Donegal, people who weren't on the curriculum, I can assure you, in the schools. But in fact, there wasn't any history taught at that time when I was a boy. The way they got over the Civil War problem uh, and the timidity of the academic his, historians was to teach no history. Uh, so the kind of background I've given you would have been unknown to um, my contemporaries in well, school. And only for the fact yeah, that I have that, to be sitting, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say I was sitting beside a lad whose father had been by accident of fate on that uh, fatal night in Hazel Hatch. I wouldn't have known that stuff either. With that background, you, had, you were destined to become a bank robber, uh, a priest, or a journalist. And so you became a journalist. Um, how, was that... How uh, do you know I didn't do the other thing under cover of... I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. So, so me and you, privately, you can tell me which of the other two that you uh, indulged in. But journalism was it the was it the influence of your mother? Was it the attraction to write? Was it the storyteller? And you it was always what, interesting. What? I always wanted to write, and I, at Black Rock, um, it's, it's, a, it's they were very kind to me, and they knew that. Uh, my background somewhat uh, erratic, and uh, they used to let me out. Uh, I remember the the uh, man in charge. We had a special place in sixth year, uh, away from the, the other dormitories for the fifth year and all the others. And uh, we had our own rooms, and um, they used to let me out uh, to cover football matches on a Saturday afternoon. And I remember. Um, he made me the president of, of this place called the castle. He was making tea for me with his own hands and brown bread and marmalade uh, as I went out to stand on the touchline and uh, watch the senior team, Black Rock, uh, playing. We had a, had a club then, and uh, I stood at my leaky shore uh, feet uh, watching them play. And uh, I got in out of the leaky feet department when. Uh, they founded the Evening Press in 1954, the year that I was leaving school, and uh, I only spoke in, in one debate. But who was the chairman of it? Only Vivian de Valera. And uh, my history teacher, Father Carroll, rang him one day, and he said, look, uh, I'm a boy here. You'd either turn out a genius or break your heart. Well, I never succeeded in doing either. But they gave me a, a start when they founded the Evening Press. And um, I, I just took off from there, making tea to begin with, which I was very good at. And, and of course, you went I was so good at him. You went on in 1966 to become the editor of the, the press. Of the morning paper, of the flagship paper, the Irish Press, yes. That, that was many years later. Um, yeah. That, of course, is founded by Eamon de Valera, who had by now retired. He was the uh, president. And uh, 
the evening press was what I became deputy editor in it eventually. It was uh, one of the bright spots in the very, very dark economic period of the 1950s in Ireland. It was a period of uh, emigration, unemployment. Um, I, I remember a man quoting to me uh, what an English friend of his had said, every time I come to Dublin, I find uh, my Irish friend has the same suit, the same job, and an extra child. And he was lucky if he had a job because uh, the gallows humor at the time, he asked, what are you going to do to leave school? Well, if you didn't have parental backing, uh, which a lot of my colleagues, of course, would have had in Black Rock, that type, professional kids, uh, you became uh, one of the 90,000, as we call them. That was the unemployed. And there was something similar to about 80, 85,000, I think, emigrated. Uh, it, it was um, a grim enough time. 1966, I believe, you wrote your first book, uh, which was yeah. a, a review of 1960. Oh, sorry, Joe. Yeah, that was the only history which you believe. It's difficult to believe now. But I wasn't joking when I said, because of the inertia of the academic historians and the Civil War, uh, none of the lads I was at school with would have known where the IRA came from, what the issues were, how did partition come about, um, how did the church get the position it had in Irish society, uh, the growth of the GEA and what it meant in Irish life. None of that would have been um, oh, remotely on their consciousness. So uh, that filled a, a void for a lot of people. and. Um, Anyway, it was my first book, but um, I didn't get much of a chance to write for several years afterwards because life an editor is fairly busy. And also the, the complication of being a, the editor of a morning paper means you work at night. Uh, an evening paper works by day. So I didn't get back to writing history for really not seriously until I left uh, 1987, and yeah. I wrote Michael Collins after that. Were, were, you ever, were you ever the object of any political pressure? Because the book in itself is a very stark critique of 1916 and the state. Were you ever under any, or did you ever feel you were under any pressure not to be rocking the boat, not to be saying the things that weren't particularly um, popular? Only on weekdays and Sundays. Oh, yeah, that's good. But you can manage all of that. Yeah. Well, with difficulty, um, and uh, I did a bit of, good bit of broadcasting, and I had six children, uh, an overdraft, a thirst. Uh, my only regret looking back on it all is that uh, I didn't get more time with my children. Uh, it's come back to me very much. Well, we're a very united family, and uh, dare I say it, a very loving family. But uh, the COVID, the lockdown, and uh, the dependence on the family that it brought about, and the fact that I have grandchildren, great-grandchildren now, um, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, a great luxury for a grandparent because uh, you have all the, the joy of childhood and see them growing and they're regard for you but you don't have the hassle of rearing children that their parents oh, I absolutely absolutely agree absolutely agree 1969 in the north of course changes everything on the island of Ireland you were one of the you're one of the few journalists that caught the train and came to the north and rather than listen to the BBC's view of what was happening you began that that process maybe that instinctive process as a journalist to investigate was that an eye opener? How, how did that? How did you deal with that? Well, first of all, Joe, um, there was what eventually became a shooting war uh, only across the bay from me. I remember um, I had very few of my contemporaries in the background I came from would have been interested in the North. The main concern would have been, quote, to keep the North from coming down here and otherwise to keep the violence out of the South. Um, 
Well, and I don't think the Republicans in the North really realized it either. Partition had worked. Two different societies grew up. And uh, I found um, initially it was the, um, my motivation to be entirely civil rights. I mean, when I started looking at the situation after seeing the first civil rights uh, march in Newry, I think it was the one I first went to, um, I remember vividly being a famous photographer in the Irish press. He still happily did the good, Coleman Doyle. Yes. And uh, the um, cops were keeping us all back. The atmosphere is very happy. And, you know, there was uh, a good deal of Guinness Republicanism about, you know, public house Republicanism and students and exuberism. It was, it was an enjoyable afternoon on a Saturday in uh, Newry. And, but you realized that the other side of it, when you came down, I think it's Sugar Walk or Sugar Bush Walk, you call it, um, and here was a barricade and all your seamen across it. I'd been chatting to one guy and asked him what he thought uh, about civil rights and about the, uh, the march, and the demo and so on. He was, he was an ordinary all your seamen in uniform. <laughs> and I said, I, I don't know about this civil rights, I'd be much better off at home watching the soccer. <laughs> but it, it very soon that day developed beyond just uh, a reasonable enough fellow standing on the side there trying to keep back uh, student demos. And I remember um, the first sign of trouble was the students rushed the barricade or the demonstrators or whoever was orchestrating the, uh, as you know, street protests in Belfast or anywhere in the north or something of an art form and uh, street theatre. Pardon? Uh, but anyhow, you're right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. but anyhow, uh, they were keeping this back and my God, to my horror, I saw that they had succeeded in getting to the bus through the barricade and they were pushing it and that there were German photographers and others over to the scattered, you know, trying to get pictures of this thing and a movement caught my eye here in the top deck of the bus was my friend and colleague Coleman Doyle photographing down at all this. And that was the position Coleman adopted, I think, all through the, the troubles. A great historical record of what happened. Uh, so I remember many years later, I was down in one of the, the local yacht clubs. And um, if you know Don Leary, you know, you look across Dublin Bay, you see Hoth Head. And the next really major outcropping you see on the sea are the mountains of Moor. And it's in sailing time or nothing. And uh, I was sitting down, we, we forget exactly what we were doing. It was a charitable occasion or something was organized in the National Yacht Club. And a group of us were having a final, final, final drink. And... Uh, one of them said to me, wonderingly, as if I had two heads. I said, how did you become interested in the North? What persuaded you? And I said, well, let's look out the window there. I became aware that there was a shooting war in my own country. So I was naturally interested in the causes of it and in what might be done to put it to bed forever, end the violence, end the division in Northern Ireland. In Ireland, as it, the border in Ireland, it's a really evil thing that we've seen recently. I mean, appalling acts of savagery. The, you know, the Quinn affair with the directors, the uh, people who were involved in trafficking, human trafficking. And that all comes from that salient on either side of the border. It's really uh, warlord territory. This is all apart from anything philosophical or political or trying to give justice to both sides. It really is damaging. and. You've seen it several times on and off. It hasn't been resolved, the debate on COVID. But we should have really addressed that, both sides of the border, on the one foot. And I became aware... For many young, for many, for many young Republicans, Tim Patrick first came to into their, to their psyche with the production and the writing of the IRA. That, that, that really serious examination of what is and who are and how difficult was that a, that book to write? Well, I was. Um, well, I tell you, 
it was a very Irish uh, and a very IRA undertaking. The first thing that happened was that uh, Cahar Goodling, who sent the chief of staff, sent Eamon McTamosh along to me to tell me not to write it. And that I wasn't to get any uh, cooperation from the movement. Um, they used to meet the United Irishmen in Gardner Street, uh, the, where their office was. In fact, it was across from Belvedere, where I also went to school. I went to the Jesuits for a few years. And I wasn't particularly taken with the Jesuits, not they with me. So um, at this stage, I declared my identity and left, as they used to say in those stories about raids, unquote, massage parlors. So I spent two years in Belvedere. But right across the road, uh, there was the United Irishman, and um, I think it was Tony Mead, in fact, he didn't deny it when I put it to him, that he was the guy who had influenced uh, Cahill Goulding. He was another journalist and a Kerry man. So I suppose, um, I don't know which of those callings inf uh, most influenced his attitude to me, but he used his influence against me anyway. But I had become very interested in the, uh, the IRA because... I had done a section on the IRA in the first book, in Ireland and the Rising. And, uh, you know, they're a very interesting topic to a writer. And I, you know, I was young in those days and um, foolhardy, I suppose. So I sent word back to Carl that uh, it wasn't his history, it was our history. And I was going to write the book, whichever. And uh, I got very friendly with poor Eamon afterwards. He had a very hard life as a result of a public and nearly went blind. He was in jail for a while. I spent some time trying to get him out, uh, but the, they insisted on in keeping him in jail, even though they just found papers on him. It wasn't a shooting affair or anything of that order. And his family suffered very badly, but he became um, a much loved figure in Ireland, in Dublin, with his histories of Dublin. And um, Anyway, he was one of the many friends I met, met along the way in republicanism. Charlie Murphy in Dublin was another man. Uh, above all, there was a man called Jack Mulvena. Uh, Jack had been uh, deputed by the Republican Congress to look after Madame Despard in the 30s. She was the wife of uh, the former uh, commander of the army in Ireland, Lord French, uh, that... Um, Michael Collins tried to assassinate as soon as he landed. Um, Dan Breen and the others, uh, you know, there were notorious efforts made to get him, but they never did. But um, he, he, Madame Despard gave a house to the Republican movement, to the left-wing movement, and Jack used to look after her. He was her minder. And he, he then, he was by trade an electrician and generally a great pair of hands, and he married, and the war came on, and he got a job uh, in the shipyards, and he had um, one of those bike motorbikes with uh, a carrier on the side where he could take a passenger. And he used to set off in the morning and that down to the, it was an ardent left-wing trade unionist. You go down to the shipyards, and uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning, of uh, his first day in the shipyards, Jack told me uh, suddenly a, a, a couple of aghast uh, shop stewards, loyalists, of course, came to him and said, Mulvena, there's word going around you're a pape, a rumor. I said, not a rumor, I am a pape. And uh, oh, Jesus, they, they nearly fainted. And uh, he, he said, I've nothing but my Protestant brother and I are friends and we must work together for our class and against imperialism and efforts to divide us through the Orange Order, etc. And uh, anyway, they, because he was a trade union, they agreed to keep him alive until lunchtime. You know, you'd be a dead trade unionist and you <laughs> via your Protestant brothers if you ever show up here again. But he again said that he was, um, you know, trade unionist and he, no, he was going to be intimidated out and he stayed on stayed on to the afternoon the shop stewards hung around near him so they kept him alive and um, he didn't get any Belfast confetti down his neck you know rivets so he yeah. went home and as he did the next day as he did for three more months 
He kissed the wife and kids goodbye. They'd be crying standing at the door. He shoved two 45s into holsters under his arm and drive down in this motorbike to, to work. And he lasted out and he became himself the chief job steward at the end. So Jack was a great uh, sort of mentor of mine. And, uh, and of course, pardon? of course, the book, you, you went on. The book well, went on to be was, a best. He, he introduced me to sort of, to all kinds of people. I mean, Dixie Courtner, you'd have known him in Belfast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I must say, I remember one day I was with him and a group of them in, in that pub at the foot of uh, Clannard Gardens near the monastery. And the yeah. four of them said uh, they were inducting me into the felons club. <laughs> I made several efforts afterwards, what happened to my membership, but it never arrived. So we, if, you we any, here, if you ever meet anybody with influence in the felons club, tell them well, I, I'd appreciate you. that honor. But anyhow- At the end of this interview, at sorry? the end of this interview, I'm gonna ask, at the end of this interview, I'm gonna ask you for a favor. So you do my favor, and I'll get you your membership card. Oh, very good. So, Consider it the, done. The book, the book, the IRA, it went on to be published. It became compulsive reading for young. I so, I hope for everybody, but certainly for young for young Republicans. And and all the way, you're still at it in the paper. You're still working in that direction. You're still working on other books. You went on to produce a variety of books. You produced, produced the book, of course, uh, De Valera, the book on uh, Michael Collins, the book on the blanket protest, the blanket men book, really was the first serious examination of, of, not, of not what was happening, but how this protest that came about. Was there any enjoyment in writing the book? Was it was it an eye opener for you? I know that you had spoke to a number of prisoners and ex prisoners at the time to try and figure out. This is at a time when respectable people were not getting involved in the issue of the blanket protest. So, what experience had that on you? Well, it was uh, exhausting. It nearly wrecked me because I I, I wrote it in some three months, uh, doing all the. Um, things you're talking about as well. And uh, by way of making life easier indeed, in the press, there was shockingly bad industrial relations. That's what brought it down in the end. And I was on a committee that used to try to negotiate uh, these the problems. In fact, in the Irish phrase, you know, tie in the go hey, tie between the two sides. That's what it literally was between management and unions. But anyhow, um, I should have told you that um, I'd met other people along the way. Uh, and uh, uh, Jack Maldonado was dead, but a principal advisor or mentor or whatever you'd call me, I call it, uh, who had taken over his position in my life was uh, Father Reed, the late Father Reed. I always Father stayed Reed, in the monastery. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't safe for me to stay in, um, you know, ordinary hotels. Or guest houses, and I, 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 to this day, I haven't crossed the door of a Belfast pub, believe it or not. The only one I have gone to is the Crown. I wanted to see where Jerry Adams worked. And <laughs> they told me that um, he was a very good barman, and he could have his job back if ever he came back. But he didn't seem interested. No, no. Um, but, uh, I had, I had. Um, with, Fa with the Father Reed, we began to discover what this dirty protest was. And uh, one day, um, a publisher came to me, was on the way into the press to ask me, uh, would I write a novel sometime? But on the way, he saw this uh, blanket protest, the blanket women walking along, bare feet. It was um, December. And very, very cold in Dublin, not with the blankets on them. And he couldn't make out what this was. So he just mentioned it to me. And uh, I, I contacted Father Reed. Anyway, he, Al, uh, was delighted because, as you remember, Joe, there was no understanding of it at all. Nobody knew anything about this volcano bubbling inside. And it, he knew better than most people. He was also a chaplain in uh, Nankesh. 
and they had on nearly demented people, but never somebody got lifted coming to him. He didn't get sleep at night, but he was um, a, a mind to put an end to the violence that he could see coming. So he took me round by the hand, as it were, and I met people, uh, people who had been very hard done by by the IRA, as well as people who had been extremely hard done by by the unionists. Uh, I remember one woman, uh, Mrs. Murphy, she was telling me she had a son in Longkesh at the time. Uh, she had a son who had been shot by the IRA, and. Uh, she didn't know that uh, her son was in the IRA. Until she saw the telltale marks of the beret across his forehead one night after he came in from a drilling session. And she was a widow. And I remember sitting with her and with Al Reid and saying, well, this, this situation, something has to be done. So I wrote the book and it had a bit of an effect, all right. It brought it to um, the attention, which was largely in the North. As I say again, partition work, there were two different societies. And the experience of living in the South is completely different to the North. Uh, living under a mean-spirited and ungenerous administration that condemned you to unemployment because of your religion. That was something they didn't understand in the South. They never saw it. And uh, the, the whole thing um, was just foreign. And then this question of the dirty yeah. protest and all that was entailed, you know. Uh, so it, it did have its bearing, though. It, it had um, some bearing on, on all that happened. And um, I want to, I want to talk, I want to talk in the last of our fifteen minutes. I want to talk about three specific books. I want to talk first of all, if you don't mind, about the book on Collins. Yes. I want to talk briefly on the the Longfellow. And I want to talk about the GAA book that you produced, I think, in 2018. It has, it has a particular importance with the whole, maybe controversy is too strong a word, but the whole, the whole discussion around the casement site in Belfast. So, first the of all, if we get Sorry, to sorry uh, Joe, do you mind repeating the shape of what? The casement, the, the casement uh, stadium that's being built in West Belfast, the GAA statement. The oh, yes, yes, the, the, the current controversy. Well, yeah. I think, uh, Joe, I, I know the rights and wrongs were a bit complex, and I think um, the Sinn Féiners and the GAA themselves have, uh, you know, some something of a case to answer for the whole thing. But nevertheless, if you look at it, it's a very apt symbol of the true nature of uh, relationships under the serve, under the veneer uh, of uh, peace and reconciliation and so on in the North. Um, that was, but the initial thing, as you know, uh, was the soccer people, uh, the rugby people and the GA all together started way in the day, back in the day, uh, with, with grants uh, from Londinium to build the stadium. Now, as you know, there's a flourishing soccer state, uh, uh, you know very well from Windsor Park, uh, a flourishing oh, yeah. soccer culture there. Uh, over in Kingsway, there's a flourishing rugby, and there's weeds growing up the pitch, and it's a state of dereliction in Caseman Park. So that to me sums up, uh, you know, the relationship. I, I, really got, I, I'm not going to um, apportion blame as were to either side, but I, I do think that one of the problems with republicanism, obviously politically and in the ultimate, they're right, but the enemy isn't so much, uh, wasn't so much London as the Protestant element on the ground. The whole growth to democracy in Ireland and setting up with the home rule was frustrated by the playing of the uh, Orange Guard. Ulster will fight and Ulster will be right. That saying is the reason that the six counties are still run from, uh, Belf uh, from London. But on the ground, the uh, beleaguered culture, if you like, and it, it developed a kind of um, 
graft of its own. Um, in the book, in the in the in the book, the GAA and the IRA, you kind of trace that joint birth, that joint history, that the foundation of the IRA and the foundation of the GAA are are almost like Siamese twins. They're almost uh, they almost came about at the same time. Well, they did. I mean, it, it all grew out of um, the, the, the whole movement for independence in Ireland. The uh, after the whole home rule movement, after the famine and the Fenians, um, Michael uh, Cusick, um, you know, finding founding the GA. You'll find in that era, just the 1880, 1880s, you'll find the whole explosion of nationalist uh, culture, examples of it, you find the Abbey Theatre, the Gaelic League, uh, and above all, the GEA. And behind that, you had the Fenians. And the Fenians believed in supporting, infiltrating, if you like, any movement that helped, that would further Irish culture, uh, Irish independence, I mean. And uh, except that they had no objection, they would use force. But they infiltrated everything, and it's probable that uh, nearly everyone who, of the few, the handful that founded the GEA in Hayes Hotel back in 1884 in Tipperary, that uh, the bulk of them, in fact, most of them were Fenians. And uh, they, that, can, that, motor, that motif, um, you know, it's persistent in Irish life, cultural development, if you like, and the physical force tradition. I mean, most Irish political parties grew out of the physical force condition. Sinn Féin, the, uh, the Sinn Féin movement, the uh, Come the Nail succeeded, Fianna Fáil, Sean McBride's uh, Republican Party, uh, Clan of Public then, 1948. And uh, you had subsequent eruptions like Sinn Féin, the Workers' Party, and so on. Um, Democratic Party. Tell me yeah. when... Oh, yes, when it, you... it, it, had, it hasn't finished, but um, what I'm coming to is that uh, all this really is, is always grinding against the rock of the Orange Order, or of the, the people, the, the successor to the planters, as it were, that are living in laggers uh, still, and... Uh, they were reared in, they didn't say anything wrong with, uh, even though they're God-fearing and the Bible, you know, such a prominent thing, the, the sheer injustice of the situation they perpetuated, apartheid it really was. Jobs in the civil service, army, police, it was an army, police force, housing allocation, all that, gerrymandering, you know, we needn't rehearse how... Yeah. Jerry exploded, but that was because of the gerrymander. They, they had put high-rise buildings in an area, corralled the Catholics in, so their vote wouldn't spread out. They should, it should have been a Catholic city returning Catholics instead of returned Protestants. In, in, um, and it, it, even using the word Protestant, while they are Protestant, it's, it's, uh, very, it, you know, it's an absolute slur on the Protestant religion, some of the behavior, the attitudes, this um, advancing on power with the... Uh, the Bible in one hand and the um, brown paper envelope in the other. Even the, um, the, the in recent times since the peace process. If I could ask you, if I could ask you just, uh, we're nearly coming to the end of the interview, but if I could ask you just one question. Sure. I want to move, I want to move on to uh, cover a couple of other books that you have, have written. Is, is that reality of the GAA coming out of cultural resistance. Is that reality something that is disguised in the current GAA or is it embraced? Is it a past that the GAA would sooner, or some sections of the GAA would sooner forget? Or are they happy that there is this historical connection, that it was actually a force of resistance as well as the sporting body? Is that a, an argument that goes on today within the GA? I suppose to a degree in, in, in the North, there might be some, some of it. You saw that argument reach the highest pitch during the H-Block um, movement. But 
the bulk of, today I'd say the main thrust and the main membership would be um, the games only. But there is this Ishka um, Fehal of water under the, the earth, uh, this tradition all the time. And um, certainly you have to remember that the pressure on the GA in the north, I mean, look at the number of people who were murdered simply because they were in the GA during the Troubles. Man found with a hurl, uh, a man who is known to have uh, sung the national anthem, the Irish national anthem, um, at, at a GA club in the loyalist area, murdered. St. Endless, look what happened to them. Uh, the, uh, to the members. So that kind of pressure comes on. But today's GEA, I'd say, is genuinely uh, just a, a, a about sport. And uh, I saw in Google Sammy Wilson being quoted as saying that the um, what the the IRA is the, no, he said the GEA is the sporting wing of the uh, IRA. Now that kind of statement is very dangerous in, 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 even today in the north and but one of the signs of the peace process and one of the reasons to answer your question why you don't uh, there isn't an active debate was i happened to be in ballet money one day ballamina ballamina and some kids went by me with uh, their ga bags and the hurling sticks and somebody remarked on that, that that was one of the fruits of the peace process you wouldn't have seen that those kids would have been in, in line for a kicking from the ouc and they paraded like that in, in the old days. But as things subside and temperatures come down, the other thing I was told about uh, Balamina that day was, uh, when, when I was talking about the three lads going by, was uh, it was a local nationalist. He wasn't a particularly Republican or anything. But he said, um, oh, yeah, it, one of the things he pointed to with great pride was the fact that the son of... Uh, the principal of a local uh, Protestant grammar school was now playing GAA. So that was, you know, so that would be a great yeah. healing thing. I think if I'd sum up, if I might, you know, um, the, the graveyard, there's a graveyard which really sums the whole thing up, the cultural and the, um, the, the sporting, the, 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 the uh, revolutionary tradition. It's uh, Seamus Heaney, where Seamus Heaney's buried, in the shadow of Balai. that. Balai, yeah. And uh, who was the first grave dug there? Who was the first in, in the same complex? Uh, Francis Hughes, the second hunger striker to die. I think that sums it all up. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, the next time you visit Belfast, casement will be resolved on its way and we'd be able to do all the things you suggest. I want to take two more points because we're rapidly running out of time. We, me and you, we share the same distinction. Uh, we were both banned from entering the United States. In my case, it was a mistake, but in your case, it was obviously a wise decision. How did that come about? Well, <clears throat> the, uh, your barring was obviously a, a clear cut. It was the, um, the republicanism. Um, and by the way, I'll answer the question. Did you know Paul McGuinness, the former manager of uh, U2, the famous band, told me this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, their breakthrough band in the world, their breakthrough occasion, was a, big, a huge concert in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, their, their lead song, there'd been a lot of commentary on it, was Sunday Bloody Sunday. Yeah. And a rumor went round that your brother was going to attend and Paul told me that there was sweating for hours before the days before the concert because the, the English tabloids would splash this Sunday bloody Sunday it wasn't Martin Newton King and you know civil rights it was going to be uh, the paratroopers and Derry and uh, he said if that happened they'd never be shown they'd never be played the it, on the BBC, and the style of so much American culture is British and influenced by them. I mean, a record or a film or, that makes it uh, in London will go to the top in America. Conversely, if they go against it, they chop you. 
and he thought uh, that uh, this would have destroyed the, the U2, but your brother didn't turn up, I think. And that was the, that. Oh, no, we didn't. No. I, I, I just we, don't we know. The have, we have a lot to answer for. Pardon? We have a lot to answer for. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's tell what Paul told me. me. But um, Tell me about your bond. No, but where, where were we? Uh, you, I was t telling you about something. You'd asked me to finish out something. What was the previous you, I was asking you how, how you ended up, um, a, a man of your character and of your, your notoriety, how did you end up being barred, albeit temporarily, from America? Oh, that had nothing to do with the struggle. That was the Israelis. It illustrates their power and their injustice. They're treating the... Uh, the Jews the way they were treated. Uh, sorry, the Jews are treating the Palestinians the way they were treated. It's a shame. I had written an article for the Sunday Independent. There had been an episode uh, shortly before, which to me was the last straw. Some working class, laboring, very impoverished Turkish seamen were on a, an aid ship coming in to bring aid. And the Israelis are blocking it from Gaza which is the longest uh, open air concentration camp really in the world. And uh, when they came near the shore, helicopters came overhead, and paratroopers abseiled down onto the shore, and they machine gunned some of these unarmed crewmen to death. And that was the end of me. I sent back my invitation to the um, uh, um, ambassador for Israeli National Day, and I wrote this open letter uh, to him and to Israel to, you know, act in a more generous fashion. And, you know, what happened was unspeakable, the Holocaust, but they shouldn't be taking this out in the heads of the innocent Palestinians, taking it in their land. I mean, we know in Ireland, in our tradition, the hatred's built up. When somebody's driven off his land and he's looking up, he's in a hillside looking down at the settler on plowing his land. And that's happening now in the desert. Uh, they've taken land off the Palestinians. So anyway, um, the, the ambassador wrote back. There was a controversy. It, it was quite a brave thing for the editor of the Sunday Independent to print the article. Um, but um, I was going over a book tour or something. I, I had a, no trouble. I mean, I, I was fairly close to the American side of the peace process. I knew what was going on and I was well thought of and regarded as somebody, uh, you know, in, uh, of uh, integrity and worth. And uh, I always regarded affection, America with great affection. And I couldn't understand that uh, my eyesight isn't the best. And I had noticed that on the email uh, that um, what I took to be the response to my application to get my visa extended, I just thought that's what it was. Yes, they said yes. But in fact, it was a grandchild pointed out, uh, the small prince said that my uh, thing had been rejected. So I went along to the embassy and I got, a, I got the, the back of the hand. This was a place I was invited to and I was quite an honored guest in the embassy. And here now I was being in the back of the bus, queued in the rain, uh, to get my visa restored and um, they were watching for it, it came to a shoot and the fellow behind the counter um, who had a reputation by this time for not uh, being too kind to visa applicants from Ireland from people they didn't like uh, or the British didn't like and uh, there was a whoop of joy and then uh, he went away behind the place having got my visa and came back and said no and um, I asked again, why is it uh, been rejected? And she said, um, why is the grass green? Why does the rain fall? You know, that was some satisfaction. But of course, I got on to my friends in, in America, in Irish America, and they're very, very highly placed on these people. In fact, it's a shame that Ireland doesn't do what the Israelis do and use the diaspora. You know, we could use it without a military aspect to get jobs and education and so forth. But anyhow, uh, within 48 hours, of course, they were on to the, it was Schumer, who is a Jew himself, the majority, you know, the minority leader in Capitol Hill. He wrote the letter and it caused consternation. And 
Within two days, my visa was restored. I got a 10-year visa, which I hadn't asked for. But um, everywhere I went in America after that, I, I, of course, I'm always delayed at the customer's point now when you go in. And the, the Zionists have a network, and they phone ahead or they text ahead to their people to mark my um, coming and, if possible, to heckle me or, you know, criticize me in some way. But that's how it happened. It was absolutely disgraceful use of, uh, of their diplomatic immunity. But they've done that before. They used, uh, they had a, a murder squad who uh, murdered a Hamas executive in um, Egypt. And uh, the, the five uh, shooters who did that, they got uh, their passports issued in um, Dublin from the Dublin embassy and um, went out as a, a tennis team. Or at least they didn't go out from Dublin, they went out from Israel. They were allegedly an Irish, an Irish tennis team. They could have got a terrible trouble for the Irish in, in the Middle East. I mean, they don't, they don't ask questions out there. They just shot whoever they got as, as um, before the word got out that who, who had done it. But when, uh, when our police went to investigate the various uh, name addresses <laughs> given on, on the passports, you know, they found there was, they're all within walking distance of the embassy, but there were lock up garages and places where nobody had lived. Uh, and so, I mean, it, that's the kind of thing they do, and it should be known, and it's, it's very wrong. I mean, I, I would just as much as I'd like to see peace in the North, I'd like to see it uh, in the Middle East. And I think both, well, as we know, I, I, it's, it's very difficult to do that. I remember John Hume saying to me in the early days, um, well, of course, we've got to be peaceful, with, with live well with our Protestant neighbors. I was asking him about Protestant Catholic relationships. And he said, but the Protestant has to take his, learn to take his foot off our neck first. And I suddenly said, Jesus, John, this isn't going to work. Uh, peaceful, non-violent approach. They won't get, people don't give in like that. There'd be terrible trouble here. And John, oh, no, no. John kept on logic and play. And this small bit of earth. Well, and that was that was back on. in civil rights days. Live on hope, Tim Pat. We're we're running out of time. <clears throat> we've been talking. We've been talking for an hour, or I've been listening for an hour, and you've been talking for an hour, which is all very good, and that's the purpose of the show. I wanna I wanna keep the promise that I made you earlier on. All right. I, I will look after. I will look after getting you your membership of the Felons Club. Ah, thank you. So that, that's. That's my promise to you. And in return for that, what I would like you to do is make a promise to me that you'll come back and the, the issues that we haven't covered in any depth. Sure, well, there were several things I was going to ask me. I was ready for it. Yeah, I'd love to do that, of course. Okay. And and thank you very much. You a very, this is yeah. the first time I ever did a podcast. First time I was yeah. ever on Zoom. And uh, it's very pleasant to be sitting in your own living room chatting with you. Drinking, drinking coffee. Uh, oh, drinking coffee and uh, out of a green mug. <laughs> oh, uh, absolutely. Well, look, listen, my on other, that note, my third tip, we'll, we'll end this note if you like. Uh, we can have yes. some uh, when we go to the Fennens Club eventually and have that drink. I'm going to order it up a paddy. It comes out of a bottle. It's Irish whiskey. And it comes out of a bottle with a map of Ireland on it. And the four provinces are on it. And uh, some seminal intellect has uh, filled in, colored in the six county, the, the, the Ulster. He's colored it in green. <laughs> well, look, listen, on, on, that, on that bit of hope, I'll meet you in the felons, I'll buy you a whiskey, and we'll plan our next uh, interview. So, from Skelta to Tim Pat Coogan, thank you.